Director of the Iskell Family Program for Leadership Development in Public Service. My name is Alan Mathios. I'm the Rebecca Q. and James C. Morgan Dean of the College of Human Ecology, and this is truly one of my most favorite events to celebrate each year. I want to first of all thank the staff and students and faculty who helped make tonight's event possible, but I am especially thrilled that Ken and Jill Iskell are with us tonight, so please join me in welcoming them and thank them for their support. Ken and Jill, can you please stand and... The ISCO Family Program is truly an inspiring program. It not only funds this lecture, but also funds summer internships. This year they funded 10 students in public service, um, and since its inception in 2007, the ISCO Summer Intern Program has supported dozens, dozens of students who have worked in community-based public service or not-for-profit agencies whose mission is to promote change and development in underserved communities. So it's just a phenomenal program, and I am privileged to talk and meet with the students after they come back from these internships, and you can see the life-changing nature of their experiences. Jill and Ken's biography is in your program, so I won't repeat all the wonderful work that they have done, but let me remind you of what tremendous, and I mean tremendous supporters, they have been to several university programs. It has been a thrill for me to get to know them and to witness their passion for the lives of our students and for making change in the world. Since 2001, the College of Human Ecology has been very pleased to be the home of this special program. I see this program personally as central to the college's mission of, de of developing leaders who address significant social, social issues. The program serves the entire university so we've been very happy for the last four or five years to have collaborated with the Entrepreneurship at Cornell program and this class so that more students across the whole university can benefit from the wonderful speakers the ISCO program brings to campus. And I am 100% confident that we will um, meet that, that great uh, quality that we have on speakers because the speaker tonight is just superb. Um, the Cornell University Urban Semester and the Public Service Center are also valued collaborators with this program, and they help identify the students for the summer internships. And all of this would not be possible without the leadership of John Eckenberg, the professor in human ecology that has taken responsibility for implementing this program. Professor Eckenberg is a professor of human development and director of the Family Life Development Center. His work focuses on early interventions for at-risk families, child maltreatment, and stress. From the beginning of the ISCO program, he has worked with the ISCO family and a planning committee to bring exciting speakers to campus, and more recently, to help develop the summer internship program. So I wanted to personally thank John for his efforts in making this program a success. John, in turn, will uh, introduce our speaker for the evening. So John, the podium is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alan. This is a great group. I'm so happy you're all here, and I'm very honored to introduce our speaker tonight. And I'm thrilled that, again, as Alan said, that this year's lecture is being jointly hosted by the Entrepreneurship Program. So I want to thank John Jacquet, who directs the Entrepreneurship Program at Cornell, and I especially want to thank Pedro Perez, the faculty instruction for the Entrepreneurship Speaker Series, for graciously sharing the stage with us this evening. I also want to thank my amazing assistant, Patty Thayer, who, uh, who does all the behind-the-scenes work. Without her, we couldn't have this series uh, take place. So thank you, Patty, and to Diana Brinkman, the college's events coordinator. They do all the work behind the scenes that we don't see, but it really makes these uh, a very successful program. So thank you for them. And And of course, a special thanks goes, I have to thank Ken and Jill again, just because they're dear friends at this point, and uh, without their help, uh, we obviously could not do this program. It's really through your vision uh, that this program is possible, so it's a real treat that you could be here tonight. Um, tonight, we really have a very special guest, Jacqueline Novogratz. 
And I'll say a few things. We have her biography in your program, and, and she has many wonderful things about her biography and many honors that she's been awarded. Uh, I won't take a lot of her time away from her because I know you want to hear from her, so please read about her biography, but I'll say a few things. Um, Jacqueline received her BA in Economics and International Relations from the University of Virginia, and after college she began a career in international banking with Chase Manhattan Bank. The, this international exposure that that job afforded her began a journey so passionately and eloquently documented in her book, The Blue Sweater, and I'd urge all of you who, who haven't read the book to go get a copy and read it. I think you'll find it very inspiring. That, led her, that experience led her to leave Chase, actually, and begin working for a not-for-profit women's organization that took her to Africa. She worked for several years in Rwanda and in Kenya, helping build organizations to help poor women start small businesses. The model involved not giving grants, but rather was built on the premise that people, even poor people with few resources, want to be independent, invest in their own futures, and will respond positively to good ideas when approached with trust and with dignity. She eventually returned to the U.S. to earn her MBA at Stanford, worked at the Rockefeller Foundation where she started some very innovative programs, and in 2001 founded the Acumen Fund. The fund now manages over $40 million, of it, $50 million of investments in Pakistan, East Africa, India, and Tanzania, supporting innovative solutions to fundamental issues affecting the lives of poor people, such as health, housing, water, agriculture, and energy. This is an incredible story that is still very much in progress. We thank Jacqueline for taking time away from her frequent travels to spend a little time with us tonight to share her experiences and vision. In her book, she says that the most big dreams start in someone's living room with a small group of people and maybe a bottle of wine or two. <laughs> While this is a bit bigger than your average living room and probably not doesn't qualify as a small group, I'm still very confident that your visit will inspire our students to dream how they can make a better world by using their skills and passion for public service. So please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Novogratz to Cornell. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really nice. Thank you so much, John, and thank you, Alan and Janice, for just an incredible day here at Cornell. It's my first time in Ithaca, and I've just really loved how beautiful the place is and how wonderful the students have been. I've been able to talk to undergrads as well as business school students, faculty, um, and I, I feel a real kinship. I also want to thank Jill and Ken. Um, they have been dear friends for a long time, and they've really helped me in lockstep for the last nine years in building Acumen Fund as supporters, as friends, as people who go through the ups and downs. And my life is 100 times richer because you're in it, so thank you. Um, and I feel really connected to Cornell because not only the Iskals, but other um, members of the Cornell community really have been part of building Acumen since the beginning. Bob Hurt, who came up to me before, was at Rockefeller Foundation when we were first really conceptually, conceptualizing the idea. And he was a real ally in making it happen. And Eileen and Jay Walker, who've been trustees of Cornell, have also been part of Acumen. And so as you get older, you start to see these communities intersect and really see the leaders emerge and care for each other and realize what a small group of people actually do change the world. So I feel really proud to be here with all of you. I want to start, though, um, particularly for those who haven't read the book, with the story of my story of um, the blue sweater. And it starts back when I was about 10 years old. And I was given a sweater by my uncle, Ed. And at that point, I always wanted to be somebody who bridged cultures. My favorite ride was It's a Small World, Disneyland. I just wanted to be a bridge builder. And this sweater had zebras that ran across the front and Mount Kilimanjaro right across the chest. And it re reminded me of Africa. Um, I wore it all the time including into my freshman year of high school when my adolescent curves were filling out the contours of the, the sweater somewhat differently. And um, I believe that there is a completely humiliating moment in every adolescent's life, especially girls. And mine was when my high school nemesis yelled across the hall that the boys no longer had to go skiing on the mountains. They could just use the mountains on my sweater. Um, <laughs> So I ran home to my mother, and we I 
felt such utter mortification, we ceremoniously dumped this sweater into the Goodwill and I thought I would never have to see it again. Well, you fast forward 10 years, and I'd left my career on Wall Street, and I was starting this microfinance bank in Rwanda, when lo and behold, I see this little 10-year-old boy 10 meters in front of me as I'm jogging, and sure enough, he's wearing my sweater. So I run up to the kid with the frenetic nature, I grab him, I turn the collar, and there's my name written on the back of the collar of that child's sweater. And I've held that story as metaphor uh, ever since for how interconnected we as, are as a world and how our action and our inaction can impact people we might never know every day of our lives. That moment was a real crossroads for me. It was a crossroads because it reminded me of where I was and that I was really in the right place doing the right thing. Um, all of us have crossroads in our lives, not only when we're 22 and trying to figure out what to do with our lives, but when we're 52 and 72 and 82 as new chapters unfold. And sometimes it's a daily event. I want to talk about a few of my chapters. One was when I was at the University of Virginia, like you, many of you, trying to figure out what to do with my life. I'm the eldest of seven kids. We were in a military family. We didn't have a lot of money. And so to go to college, you had to pay it for it yourself. And I, I tended to work 40 or 50 hours a week while I went to school. So I told my parents at the end of the university that I was tired, and I was going to take a year off to ski. Um, and earn money as a bartender. And they, being wise, didn't say, you can't do it. They said, we think that's a really good idea, but why don't you interview? At least go through the process so that you'll see what it feels like. And I kind of relent, reluctantly got a gray suit, and I put my, my um, resumes in the boxes that took economics and foreign affairs. And one was Chase Manhattan Bank. So I go into the interview, and the guy says to me, so, tell me why you want to be a banker. And I looked at him, and I said, well, actually, I don't want to be a banker. Uh, my parents are making me go through this interview process. I really want to change the world. And he says, um, well, really, that's, that's unfortunate. Because if you got this job, you'd be in 40 countries in the next three years. You'd learn about the economies of these, the developing world, and you'd be able to change the world. And I was like, oh, man. Do you think we could start this interview over? And he was young and cute, and he was like, sure, why not? So I literally left the room, knocked on the door, came in, introduced myself as Jacqueline, and he said, so tell me, why do you want to be a banker? And I was like, ever since I was six years old, all I ever wanted to be was a banker. <laughs> so the lesson is keep your heart open to opportunities. And sometimes market yourself as hard as you can to get one that looks good. My second crossroads, Rio de Janeiro. The bank did take me to 40 countries. It changed my life. It taught me things I had never imagined before. I loved so many of the places that I went, but there was nowhere like Brazil. Brazil was alive, it was colorful, it was beautiful. Um, and I liked being a banker. But what struck me in Brazil was that we were writing off hundreds of millions of dollars to, from loans that were often made to elites who never had any intention of repaying, while people in the middle, lower classes including people in the favelas, not only couldn't get access to credit, many of them didn't have the courage to walk through the doors of the bank. So I went to my boss, and I said that I thought maybe we should have another strategy of lending to the poor, and we might get our money back and do something good for the country. And he literally gave me a book called The Innocent Anthropologist. Um, it was a real wake-up call for me, and I realized that maybe the banks would come around, and in fact, when you get older, you see that everything does come around. Now the commercial banks have a huge focus on lending to low-income populations. Um, but that I needed to push the inevitable. And so I reached out, and I learned about uh, Dr. Yunus in the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh and Ilabat in India. It was pre-internet, so I had to send these ridiculous letters and trying to... I never really got through to Ila. I did to Grameen. Um, but I found a group in New York. And I went to the women and I said, I will do anything to work in microfinance. I want to understand how, what it takes to uh, lend to the poor. And she said, great. And I said, and I really want to go to Brazil. And she said, sorry, we're sending you to Africa. And I was thinking to myself, but that's not in my life plan. I want to go to Brazil. Brazil wasn't the option. And I often meet young people today who have a plan and they want to stick to it. And the lesson that I learned at that crossroads was, be really clear on what it is that you really want to accomplish. I love the beauty of Brazil, but I really wanted to understand banking. So Africa, I went to. 
I ended up in the hills, not of Rio, but of Kigali, Rwanda, a place I could not locate on a map, but it didn't matter. And there, as John said, I met six incredible Rwandan women, some of them high-powered. And we decided that we were going to create history. We were going to create the first bank for women in the country. At that point, women couldn't open a bank account without their husband's signature. So it was a really big deal. Ultimately, we did. We created not only the first bank for women, but the largest bank in the country lending to the poor. And it was an incredible experience. And as a 25-year-old, to see what a small group of people really can do, and that we really did create history, is something that has continued to inspire me throughout my life. I then left, and I went back to the United States. I went to business school, and I landed at the Rockefeller Foundation. I learned a lot about philanthropy. I learned more global issues, and I started something um, in leadership. But you can imagine in 1994, when I opened the newspaper one day, and I saw that there was a genocide occurring in Rwanda, what it did to my psyche. I would wake up at night wondering which of my friends were being macheted. What had happened to the institution, not only the bank, but I had also created a bakery at the same time, wondering what the nature of man really is. And so I decided I had to go back. My mother wasn't that excited about that decision either, um, but I did. And I sat with the women, and what I discovered was that these six women had played out every conceivable role in the genocide. They had watched their families being massacred. One was killed in the first hour. One were, two were bystanders, and one was one of the major perpetrators of the genocide. In fact, that woman on the left, Agnes, was convicted uh, a year ago of, of uh, committing major crimes of genocide. And so confronting what it really means to be human became an obsession of mine. And for the next four years, I took my summer vacations in Rwanda, and that really became the, the, the crucible for the book. What I ultimately learned in that experience and in all the experiences through those first 15 years were three important lessons that have really informed my work today. The first is that dignity is more important to the human spirit than wealth. Too often, economists look at the poor in terms of $1.25 a day, under $2, $4 a day. What I have seen are people who make $3 and $4 a day who literally live happier, more joy-filled lives than many people who make 10 or 100 times more. The, the issue of poverty is not around income. The issue of poverty is around choice and opportunity. It's around freedom. And freedom is what links to dignity. And if I've learned anything in my life, it's that we're not talking about dignity just of the poor when we create a world that brings opportunity. We're talking about dignity for all of us. The second is that traditional charity and aid alone are not going to solve the problems of poverty. Anyone who has spent a lot of time in development finds a weariness from seeing too many programs that are top down and look at the poor as, charitable, as passive recipients of charity thinking that we have the solutions to their problems, and then being surprised when nothing ever works. The, there, there's a need for charity. There always will be. And we could talk about the different reasons. But by itself, it's not going to solve the problems. At the same time, over the last 10 years, there was a real market ideology, this sense that the markets alone are going to solve poverty. And we pointed to China, and we pointed to India. And what we didn't recognize is that while the, while economic growth does lift people out, some people out of poverty. It also increases the gap between rich and poor. And how we see ourselves relative to one another is just as important to where we stand in absolute terms. Uh, the markets alone are not going to solve the problems. And so in 2001, when I was at the Rockefeller Foundation, with their support and the support of a lot of individuals, I started the Acumen Fund with this idea that there was a middle way that we called patient capital. It lay between the markets and between charity. And the idea was we could raise philanthropic money. But instead of just giving away, we would invest patient capital, so long-term money, uh, 10 years if necessary, five and seven at, at a minimum, in, in loans or in equity, in companies and in nonprofits in the developing world that saw the poor as customers and design solutions from their perspectives, solutions that were affordable, accessible, and that were valued by the poor. And that over time, after we supported it with a lot of management assistance, we would measure the change not only in the, whether we got our money back or not, but also in social impact terms. 
And today, as John said, we've invested about $50 million in 50 companies. And we've seen those companies bring another $200 million into these markets that people had seen as throwaway or invisible. And we've seen 35,000 jobs created and tens of millions of products. We're starting to change the imagination of what's possible when we're looking at the poor. I want to give you an example as to why patient capital is so important and why these entrepreneurs with crazy ideas are so important. The guy in the yellow is a good friend of mine. His name is Amitabha Sidangi. He's from India. We're about the same age. He's been working with poor farmers for about 20 years. And in India, 200 million farmers make less than a dollar a day. And Amitabha, like me, was obsessed with why so much wasn't working when it came to low-income farmers. On the one hand, he said, the charity approach was giving people the wrong inputs. The markets were missing them altogether, and the government subsidies were out of the, the control of low-income people. He was obsessed with Israel, because Israel had developed drip irrigation, which was a way of taking little tubes um, from a source of water right to the stalk of a plant so that it could transform these deserts into emerald fields. But again, drip irrigation in Israel was focused on the large-scale commercialization, not the smallholder farmer who had an acre to deal with. And so he got into the heads of the farmers. The first thing he focused on was what he called miniaturization. If a farmer has an acre and they're the most risk-averse people on the planet, you need to compartmentalize. You need to design this technology so that they only have to risk a quarter of their acre. It's portfolio management. The second was affordability. It had to be so affordable that they could borrow or find the money to pay for it and see that money come back in a single harvest with enough money for what he calls infinite expansion. That, that with the first, the first harvest uh, income, they could buy their second quarter acre, and so on and so on and so on. We gave a loan, patient capital, to allow him to experiment. No traditional investor was going to invest in him. And today, the, over 350,000 farmers have bought these systems. That's almost 2 million people that are moving out of poverty, seeing their yields double, triple, sometimes quadruple. But that wasn't enough. What we then started looking at was how we really scale this, how we really grow it. And so we converted um, what he was doing into a for-profit company as well. Acumen owns half of it, and IDE India, the nonprofit, owns the other half. And today it's a $4 million company. It's one of our most profitable, despite the fact that it sells to some of the poorest in the world. We also looked at replicating. And this is where some of our core values really come in. And the most exciting replication to me has been on taking it to Pakistan. Now, it's really hard sometimes to get real communications between the Indians and the Pakistanis. But Amitabha and Dr. Sona Kangarani are really special people. And so we've been working in Pakistan for a long time now. And there was one day that I won't go into the whole story, but I drove about eight hours from Karachi on a 120-degree day in the desert, really internalizing how monochromatic and how truly arid this part of the world is, where most of the people live in bonded labor and make about 50 cents a day. And there we came upon this farmer named Rajan, who had 12 kids and 50 grandkids. And um, there they were standing in front of a field of sunflowers growing seven feet tall. This is the kind of focus on dignity and allowing people to solve their own problems that's at the heart of Acumen Fund. My work has allowed me to work with some of the most extraordinary leaders in the world. And they're leaders because they have an imagination, what we call it, Acumen Fund, moral imagination, the ability to put themselves in another's shoes. And they, des they take on a design uh, approach to everything that they do. I want to share just a few of them. In, in uh, India, most people get their energy from kerosene. It's really dirty. It's very dangerous, 36% of all respiratory disease is connected to it, and kerosene alone throws 100 million tons of carbon into the atmosphere. The reason that the poor haven't, done, haven't been able to move into other energy sources is because they can't afford it. And so Sam Goldman at the D School at Stanford focused on designing a solar torch that costs about $10 and building a distribution system so that all the people along the way could, could earn a little bit of profit. And now over a million people have light because of Sam's work. And we've helped take it from India to Tanzania and hope to move it all around the world. David Kuria was a, is an entrepreneur in Kenya 
who was sickened by the fact that 50% of the country had no access to public sanitation. Open defecation is more the norm than using toilets. And so he was focusing on a behavioral change as well. There were public toilets, but nobody would go near them because they were filthy, they were dangerous, they were disgusting, they were the opposite of dignity. What David understood is that we make decisions as human beings based on whether we're valued, based on status, based on beauty, based on comfort. And so the Ecotech toilets are big, they're beautiful, they have showers if you want, they have music that pu they pump in, so you have a good experience when you're inside. And this year, 10 million people will use the toilets in Kenya. Now it's being transferred to Tanzania and to Uganda. The power of social enterprise and the power of vision. And inclusion. A number of students today asked me what one of the, what's the risk of the social enterprise model. And I said the risk is that sometimes people will hear us and think you can make money and change the world for the poorest people on the planet. That is not the message. The message is that you can use the market as a listening device. That the market will enable people to, to make decisions with their feet when, if you give them a gift, they're, more, they're very likely to say, thank you very much, we love the gift and then kind of turn around and ask what's wrong with the person who just gave it to me. If you ask them to pay even a small amount, you'll find out very quickly whether they appreciate the quality or not. LifeSpring Hospitals is another example. We own 50% of this for-profit hospital that's dealing with very low-income women in, in India. In India, the public health system is one of your only options as a poor woman. And again, you face a lot of obstacles. It's an important system. But we're hoping that through LifeSpring, we'll show the world that there's another way to do it as well. What LifeSpring is learning through taking a very low-cost approach, but providing very high quality to the, for the poor, is that they can reach a lot of women. We've grown from one to nine hospitals over the last three years. They're also re realizing that there's a real limitation to the market. And so the value of inclusion. Anand Kumar is now looking into what will it take to set up a separate fund so that those of us who have resources can pay the $80 that it costs for a woman who comes and is so indigent she can't pay even a fraction of it. Inclusion. And finally, excellence. I get really exhausted when I hear people say, well, I've got this good product for the poor. Um, it's poorly designed. It's fairly mediocre, but it'll do. Uh, not good enough. We need something better. And so when Sumitomo uh, a chemical company in Japan decided that it wanted to find an entrepreneur and experiment with whether African entrepreneurs might be able to, do, to manufacture the long-lasting malaria bed nets. We helped identify Anusha of A to Z in Arusha, Tanzania. We made a loan. We helped identify the, the knitting machines. The entrepreneur had to take a big risk. Nobody would finance them, so we financed them. Long story short, Today, they employ 8,000 people, mostly low-income women. And those women produce 30 million life-saving bed nets a year that provide protection for up to 60 million people a year. It's an African solution for an African problem. It's really exciting because inside the factory, the throughput rates, the number of nets that are produced per day, are on par with those, with those rates in Asia. And so we can bring people and show a very different image of what Africa is capable of. And I think that's really another piece of the work that we need to do, and we need to do it together. When I was in Rwanda, I said that I, 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 I struggled with the nature of what it means to be human. And at the bottom, I decided that we yearn to be good, all of us, but that angels and monsters live inside of us, each of us, and that too often we have systems that bring out the bad sides of us, and that some, one of the great leadership challenges for today is to build those solutions that bring out our better angels. And so while I can talk about patient capital and social enterprise constructs that I think can lead the way to make real change in the world, at the end of the day, what we need more than anything else, and we need it from each one of you in this room, is moral leadership, a new way of leading that recognizes how complex the world is and we're constantly trying to balance hard and soft. Martin Luther King always said that love without power is anemic and sentimental, and that power without love is reckless and abusive. We need leaders who are unafraid to walk holding love and power. One of those leaders is Jawad Aslam. He's a young Pakistani-American born in Baltimore, 
grew up there, and got into commercial real estate. 9-11 happened, and he said, I want to go to Pakistan. I want to understand the country of my forebears, and I want to see how I can make a difference. And he called me, and he said, you know, where can I go? And remembering who I was when I wanted to do that, I said, well, there's an amazing entrepreneur named Tasneem Siddiqui. He works outside the slums of Karachi, and he's developed an incremental approach to low-income housing that we think really works. And so Javad went. He got paid nothing, but he lived in the slums, he worked in the slums, he apprenticed with the master. And in time, he was ready to go to Lahore, Pakistan, and lead the building of Saiban, which was, would, would and now is a 300, um, housing, 300 house development uh, for low-income people. But it was a really long road with lots of crossroads. The, uh, whoops, sorry. When I first went and we were deciding whether we would finance, it looked like Kandahar, just the moon. There was nothing there. I mean, it takes a lot of vision, but it was the only place it had. It was about 25 kilometers outside of the center of Lahore. But Javad was sure that if he built it, people would come. It took a year and a half for Javad to get the land registered because he refused to pay a, bribes, a bribe, crossroads. Every time he said no, they wouldn't give him the registration. Finally, he got the registration and he built one house. I went to see that house and he was so confused that day because while he had this beautiful house that people could afford that was so much better than they were living in the slums, nobody would sign up. And the reason they wouldn't sign up is they didn't trust. They'd been ripped off so many times. Why should they trust this American who was coming in to create something different, something expensive, something that they would have to risk their lives on? As it so happened, it was a really rainy day. It was the monsoon season. You had to kind of walk really carefully through. And we had bad luck. Bandits came to a nearby village. And before we knew it, we were in a crossfire of 50 boys with machine guns and rifles shooting at each other, unfortunately, across us. Um, the good news was nobody was hurt. The next day, we went back to continue our visit. And um, right after that, people started buying houses because they realized we were going to show up. And leadership is so much about showing up. And as I said, he started going, continued, lots of obstacles. Um, and he took ideas from all over the world. And that's something you, your generation can really do in a way that mine couldn't. He read The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. He learned that the best way to build community is to create blocks of no more than 150 people. So he built. 25 houses around a garden, and then he made it the, the community's responsibility to make that garden beautiful. Now 300 families, or almost 2,000 people, live in this development. I couldn't be prouder of what he's accomplished. I last visited in May, the day after the Emedy Mosque attack. I don't know if you all remember this, but it was middle of May. It was a Friday afternoon. And the Emadis, which is an is, is a Islamic sect, were praying. Now, the Emadis are considered by many to be apostates, by fundamentalists to be apostates. And yet, the only Nobel laureate produced by Pakistan is an Emadi. Um, and these people were praying together when terrorists attacked and massacred them, and about 100 people were killed. So the next day, I went to Saiban to visit Javad. And at Saiban, there's one mosque. And it's a very diverse community, people from many Muslim sects, including Shia and Sunni. And you can imagine the community really fought over who would get to use the mosque on Fridays. So Javad, being unafraid to take risk and unafraid to, tr to use transformational leadership techniques, worked and worked and worked. And finally, the community decided that they would pick three imams, and the imams would rotate. Friday prayer, and the whole community would pray together. It's an extraordinary story, and it's an extraordinary story of hope. And it's not just a small story, because now Javad is starting the first for-profit commercial housing development um, that's ever been done for the poor in Pakistan. And the government of Punjab, the largest state in the country, has set up a unit to expedite registration, because we were very vocal about the fact that he couldn't get registered because he wouldn't pay bribes. So he's changing policy, and he's changing mindsets. The next day, I was talking to a young woman from the Acumen community. 
And she had just gone to a vigil for the victims of the mosque attacks. And I, I asked her what gave her the courage to go. Everyone knew that going to see this mosque um, and to pray for the, the victims was extremely dangerous. And she looked at me and she said, Jacqueline, if not us, who? And it's this kind of leadership, it's this kind of moral imperative that we need in our world today more than we ever have. Your generation faces huge challenges. Every generation does. But yours are really big. The financial crisis. We've had a financial crisis that le has left, even in this country, 14% of people now living in poverty, 25% of people living on food stamps. Real concern over the future of capitalism and a real need not only to reimagine our economy so that we include everyone in it, but a way of reimagining business altogether, a way of, of thinking about profit that measures not only the financial returns that come to us, but the natural resources that we use and the benefits that we create. So that we start creating a different set of metrics and incentives for how people behave. Your generation is key to helping us figure this out. And global warming. I went to Pakistan um, during the floods because I needed to see my community. I needed to, to be with the investments. I've fallen in love with this country. And to see 20 million people homeless, and what that means, 20 million people to have lost everything. That's 40 Katrinas, and the world isn't responding. We need to raise a voice. We need to find a way to get people to care. My husband and I took the photographs that I, I took, and we created this video, and we put it on YouTube. And the good news is about 60,000 people have seen it. And the bad news is that we've gotten hundreds of the most hateful comments I can imagine seeing. People saying, I'm praying for more rain. Why should we help the terrorists? Things that are humiliating even to read. I can't imagine what it feels like to write. We're living in a world where global warming is creating monstrous changes. In, in, in Pakistan this summer, it was 130 degrees. And those floods were, were due because the glaciers are melting. But they were also due to things that man has done. Massive deforestation, all illegal. We need new models for dealing with poverty and dealing with progress in a way that thinks about our natural environment, that deals with the issues that we face as a world in global warming. And as I was talking about fear, I came home, of course, to all of the news about the burning of the Quran and the, the, the arguments over the mosque in New York City. And I thought to myself, this is a moment when you think of the confluence of all the things that your generation is going through as a world. It's actually not that difficult to understand why people are retrenching, why people are moving back in fear and wanting to blame the other. At the very moment, we need to walk forward. We need to open our arms and expect no, thought, no thanks for that in return. That's the essence of leadership. And I was talking to a good friend of mine recently who's about 20 years older than me. So I was kind of like you were when he was like I am. And um, he was part of the civil rights movement. And he reminded me that in the civil rights movement, there was a lot of fear, and there was economic anxiety, and there was total focus on the other. Martin Luther King used to talk about the white moderate, that what really frightened him was not the radical, was not the passive, but the, the white moderate that would say, yes, 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 this is a really important problem, but just wait. Time will, time will make this work out. And he said, no, again, you have to push the inevitable. And when you really think about the civil rights movement, it wasn't that many people that got on those buses in the summer of 1963. It wasn't that many leaders who came together, like Ella Baker and John Lewis, who had the guts to stand up for what was right and build systems that brought out our better angels. I had the incredible privilege of working with Dr. Robert Coles, who was another one of those heroes in the civil rights movement. And he told us a story about a little girl named Ruby Bridges. He's a child psychologist. And Ruby was one of the first kids to desegregate the South, five years old. And every day for a month, she would walk through this big barricade of white people screaming epithets at her. Um, you're a monster, all the stuff that they could think of. And she would walk in her little dress, full of dignity, full of beauty. And he would see her talking. And he would say to her, 
Ruby, what are you saying? Who are you talking to? And she would say, nobody. And finally, he sat her down, and he said, Ruby, I see you talking every day. And she said, Dr. Coles, I'm not talking, I'm praying. And he said, well, what are you saying? What are you praying? And he said, she said, I'm saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they are doing. What struck me when I talked to my friend Ray Vocato, who watched her whole family get slaughtered and was helping her identical twin sister die in the genocide, was she used the same phrase. She said, before my sister died, I had to have her forgive the killers, or she might not go to heaven. And so we said together three times, forgive them, Father, for, not, for they know not what they are doing. We can't wait, and your generation certainly can't wait. It's the moment for change, and it's the moment for action. So many of you today have said, you know, should I join the corporate sector after school? Should I go to the nonprofit sector after school? If you take one thing away from what I say, it's that what you should do is listen to your heart. What you should do is focus on the things inside of you that make you beautiful, that make you want to sing. Because if you follow that path, and you really focus on our biggest issue, which is extending the fundamental belief that all men are created equal to every human being on the planet. Whether you're a banker, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a social entrepreneur or a farmer or a computer technologist, it really doesn't matter. It's how we live in the minutes of our days. One of the Acumen Fellows is a lovely uh, young man named Joseph Yadahanga from Uganda. And he spent his year at Acumen working in Western Kenya with a hybrid seed company. And he said to me, when I think about leadership, I think about a pinnacle of rice. He said, because rice is food. Rice is nourishment. Rice feeds the world. But right before the harvest, that pinnacle of rice bows down in homage to the earth. And when I think about leadership, I think of the importance of soaring and focusing on the sun and thinking about nourishing others, but doing so with a gentleness and a humility that always stays grounded. And so my wish for all of you, as you go forth in your lives, is that you will think of that rice um, and that you will think about the kind of leadership we need, which is a leadership that rejects petty ideology and trite assumptions a leadership that dares to imagine a world that we can create together, a leadership that dares to risk and fail and get up and try again. Robert Kennedy, to paraphrase him, said that very few of us have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And it is in the total of those events that the history of this generation is made. Your generation is like none we've ever seen before. You're beautiful. And you have the tools and the technologies and the resources that we've never had as a world to make changes. My mentor, John Gardner, said, the world is facing incredible problem, incredible opportunities described as, disguised as insoluble problems. That's all there is. And so I wish you Godspeed. I wish you the, a focus on a world that's complex, but that has every possibility for change in it because of you. And as my little brother tells me, because his favorite uh, philosopher is Yoda, um, in his words, there is no try, there is only do. So Godspeed, and I feel honored to be among you. Thank you.
Thank you. So you've been through quite a bit, starting with uh, Chase Manhattan, going on to Rockefeller, starting the Acumen Fund. Where do you see, see yourself in 15 years? <laughs> That's such a great question. Well, you can probably tell with me that I don't really think about myself in the future. It's more, what does life bring? I could see myself um, doing what I do for the rest of my life, whether it's at Acumen Fund or connected to Acumen Fund. Not doing the everyday management that I've been doing, but to um, essentially help others around the world build Acumen Funds. Um, I, th I think this idea of patient capital um, is one of the most important ideas of our generation, and I want to be one of the ones that really push it. Yeah. One more prompt, and we'll go in the back. Okay, so, so in, in the spirit of doing and trying to push the inevitable, what would you recommend to give some students some direction? How can we get out there as quickly as possible and hopefully do some work ourselves, but also empower other people? And if I might admit, with uh, a student who's myself, uh, heart side going to Brazil, do you have anything particularly for that? <laughs> I'm still trying to get myself back to Brazil. My team is always like, why do we have to look at Brazil? Um, and we don't work there yet, but we will. Um, I, I, I think it's really what I said in that uh, I think sometimes when I meet young people that come and want advice, um, they often want it, they, 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 they want to go out and do things, but they sometimes want it on their terms. I actually think there are a lot of opportunities out there, and sometimes you should just take it. And don't ask a lot of questions and see what, what you'll learn from it. There's websites like idealist.org that have great opportunities. And if it's a miserable opportunity, well, you'll learn something from that, too. You're at such a young age that some of those failures actually might be the most important things that you do. And so I know it sounds trite at some level. And when you're trying to actually figure out how to operationalize that, really frustrating. Um, another dirty word often when you're young is networking. Um, but the truth of life is, and when I talk about Jill and Ken and Bob and these friends of mine who've been around for a long time, the relationships that you create in your life, if you really nurture them, are what will build your life and what will make it rich. And so you shouldn't think about networking in a transactional way, but rather in a way that's about crafting and creating a life. And so find those people you respect. Be bold, write them letters, and every now and then that letter will get through if it's a dream of yours. Um, and I would really say follow the leader, regardless of where they are. They might not be doing exactly what you want to be doing, but they'll teach you a lot as well. Just focus on where you're going to build new tools, um, because I really feel that there's an apprenticeship that you go through. I couldn't have started Acumen Fund in my 20s. Uh, I, I wasn't ready, or even in most of my 30s. I was almost 40 when I started it. Uh, I had to do a lot of apprenticeship first. And I had to do a lot of dumb jobs and great jobs. And frankly, bartending was as important as anything else I did. And so to remember that. That way in the back there. Yeah. I uh, went to the cultural that about learning the problems of other people. And I realized I spent a third of my life in the Dominican Republic, and then I grew up here, and I've uh, learned a lot and been open to meet things that are invisible to people. Uh, through that, I was wondering, how do you recommend that we can like see what we can, what most cannot see? How can you be entrepreneur, entrepreneurs that um, see other cultures and the colleagues? That's a great question. One of my first weeks in Kenya, I made a huge cultural faux pas. And I was really uh, humiliated by it. And um, this wise African woman said to me, Kenyan woman said to me, don't worry about it, Jacqueline, because you, you obviously are well educated. And I thought that she meant it in a snobby way. And what she meant was that my parents taught me good manners. And that people aren't dumb. People see people who are real. And if, if, you, if you really deal with every person in a way that is almost like meeting a new person anew and starting from a place of respect. We've got this gorgeous photograph at Acumen Fund. And it's of a shanty in Soweto with this beautiful girl pirouetting in a tutu. And it's, it's really iconic for us, when, for our kind of tagline of imagine a world beyond poverty. That if you start from a place of focusing on the beauty, and if you start from a place of recognizing where people are, 
even if you don't agree where they are, you have a much better a chance of getting them where you want them to go. And so I, I would say it, it, in some ways it comes back to the basics of what it means to be good. Um, and that's start by assuming goodness and assuming that you have something to learn from that other person. Because at the end of the day, you just have no idea who you're talking to. Hi there, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm um, Elisa Miller Al, I'm a local entrepreneur here in Ithaca. And um, my question is two parts, but they're related. Um, one is what kind of a process do you go through to select these, some of these entrepreneurs in these, in these countries? And the other part is I'm curious, I think the success stories are beautiful, but I'm also curious about the failure and how often, you know, how often these ventures don't work out. What steps do you kind of take to prevent the failures and handle the failures when they do happen? Just curious about that. Thank you. Um, sure. Uh, trying to answer it quickly because that's like a 10-hour uh, question. question. Um, in terms of the, in terms of the entrepreneurs, um, we look at three things. One, are they really focused on the low-income part of the population? Because a lot of people say they are, but they're not really. Um, and do they have the vision, not only to deliver an affordable service, but to do it at what we call scale, to reach at least a million people, and sustainability? Over time, will they cover their costs? Because if they can't, at the end of the day, it's going to go the, the way of too much of development and too much of philanthropy. When the donor runs out of money, the project is gone. So that's really what we look at, vision, uh, sustainability scale. And then, most entrepreneurs are not great managers. And so, do they have the self-awareness to know that they better have a really great management team? And we make sure that they do that. And that's one of the ways we focus on them not failing. We've had a whole s assortment of failures. Um, this morning, I talked about uh, a hearing aid where we got really excited about the technology because it was so cool. and. It only cost $30, and it was as good as the $3,000 one on the model on the market. And um, we got $10,000 out, and then we realized that people really didn't want to wear hearing aids. It didn't impact their jobs enough. It didn't impact their income enough. And so we really kind of missed the boat. We got the right technology and the wrong business model. We've had failures when we've bet on the wrong entrepreneur, and we found out that they uh, don't share the same values that we do. Uh, issues of corruption, and we have exited from those. Very painful, hard to do with grace when you don't want to destroy a person because he thinks that's the way business is done and you want to maintain your integrity and build your reputation. Hard, but we do it. Um, we've had failures because we got uh, too excited about an idea without really, really understanding who, was our, who our co-investors were, so the people that were putting in money side by side. And so we were saying, go slow, understand, build up the profitability of each one of these clinics. And our, pro our partners were saying, go fast, make as much money as you can, and the thing exploded. Uh, so there have been lots of different kinds of failures. I said before, and I really believe it, I think that we need to talk more about failure. And I think that you will not meet an honest entrepreneur that hasn't failed a lot. It's almost part of the definition. And so we need to go into it, not in a silly way, but in a way that recognizes that it's through failure that we learn the most. And the, 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 the real failure is either in not learning or is in blaming somebody else rather than looking at ourselves and moving from it. I'm getting the sense that you guys are needing to go somewhere. So should we? Let's do two more questions. Okay. How about, how about this guy back here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I want to be very honest with what I want to say. Um, I'm not going to make a question. I'm going to make a comment. Um, I want to thank you for coming here. I want to thank you for making us conscious because we're going to hear something in this bubble in Cornell um, that we go out, we go to jail, we go to Vino, we party. It's, a, it's true. We're and that's what you're supposed to do at this point in your life. <laughs> but however, however, I find that sometimes our lives are so are not, we're not very conscious, we know this, we read it in the papers, we see it, but we just think that other people are going to take charge of it, not about us. And I want to thank you for coming here, because it's about us, it's about the leadership in this, in this, in this room right here. We're the new generation, like you were saying, 
we are the ones that are supposed to be starting this. So I want to thank you because I think the message, I think it's going to get through people here. And for example, I'm trying to start something like you in Puerto Rico, where I'm from, where I people, a lot of people need help. And you know, then thank you for coming, really, because I think it, it gets to the, to the mind of people here, where our priorities are, and we're supposed to be going forward. I want to thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I don't want to end on a macabre note, but um, to your really beautiful statement, and I so appreciate it, uh, just to remember that when you're your age, life feels really long, and, f and, 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 and it should. Um, but let me tell you the other side. No. <laughs> the truth is, we don't know how long life is. And one of my dear, dear friends who helped me build this Next Generation Leadership Program was named Lisa Sullivan. And she used to say all the time, there's actually this great Sweet Honey in the Rock song called We Are the Ones We've Been Waiting For. And um, it's about leadership. And it's exactly what you're saying. And we had this great conversation when she was 40 years old, and then a week later she died. And she lives inside of me. But she didn't get to fill all those dreams. And so you're right. We're waiting for you guys. And you need to be waiting for you guys. But that's where the sense of urgency, um, you just don't ever know. So. I think that's a great way to <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.